I'm going to kind of sum up, you know, some of this with what, you know, Daniel Guerin, the great sort of anarchist who was influenced by Marxists, wrote about. Um, you know, Guerin dates the end of the Bolsheviks' libertaire period at the spring of 1918 and explains it by the dualism of Marxist ideas about the state, which Lenin summed up in September 1917 in his book, The State Revolution. The two extremes, two t- contradictory concepts cohabitated in Marxist thought. A libertarian version that clearly wanted to abolish the capitalist state, and an authoritarian version that preferred to establish the establishment of a new Marxist state, which was supposed to fade away on its own, but lived endlessly on. And so there was, um, you know, there was a real there was a real divide. You know, so early on, you see a lot of liberatory movements. You know, so you see the development. You know, like they legalize abortion, they decriminalize homosexuality, they. Um, continue to maintain opposition political parties and political journal and political newspapers. And- All right, are we live? I think we're live. <laughs> yeah, we're live. <laughs> testing, uh, testing. Hi, and welcome to-, to Red Reviews. Um, podcast where we talk about uh leftist books and other books with an anarchist with an anarchist and marxist uh perspective (laughs) with my friend friend justin thank you for joining me justin thank you Corey. it's always a pleasure it's always fun uh this is it's so great like i said in my on our last episode we did on tuesday uh i i'm so excited to be back doing the show after a little bit of a hiatus uh, getting over what was like the flu, the cold, COVID, something. I have no idea, but it was awful. And I'm getting better now. And I'm very excited about talk to talk about the book we're going to be talking about tonight because um, I love this book. And I think it's going to pair well with one we've talked about before. Some random geek is here. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it live. Hi, some random geek. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, it's always good to have um, some live folks with comments and questions oh. our our reliable peanut gallery it's always a joy to see you thank oh, you and kerrigan's here yay thank you kerrigan i hope so man Ooh. <laughs> it's like it's like i gotta do good i gotta yeah, do good today right. <laughs> the pressure's um, on <laughs> the pressure is on it really really is um so yeah, so um, earlier in the year, or it may have been last year, we did um, an episode uh, about a book um, also published by PM Press um, called Libertarian Socialism, Politics in Red and Black, or Black and Red. Um, love that book. I think that if you are somebody on the left who wants to understand the sort of history and the broader strokes of the sort of... Uh, the sort of, I would say, sort of frenemies-esque relationship between anarchists and Marxists, although I think it's much more conciliatory than than confrontational. I think people should check out that book. Um, It's great. Um, The one we're going to be talking about tonight is another book that I feel like really complements that book um, and in some respects really hones in on the ways in which anarchist theory and Marxist theory and Marxist ideas and movements, um, where they conflict, but then also really where they um, come together and can lead to something better. And so the book that we're, ch- we're reviewing tonight is Revolutionary Affinities um, Toward a Marxist Anarchist Solidarity um, by Michael Lowy and Olivier Bessonsenau. Um I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Michael Lowy is, um, is a member of the French section of the Fourth International um, and his books and articles have been translated into 30 languages. He is the Emeritus Research Director of the CNRS, the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Um, for those who don't know, the Fourth International is largely Trotskyism. Um, so that's the, what, that's what the Fourth International. Right. And then Olivier besson uh is the founding spokesperson, was the founding spokesperson for the new anti-capitalist party. And uh, he has written with Michael Lowy or Lurry before. Um, on a book called Che Guevara, His Revolutionary Legacy. Um, and so this book was obviously originally written in French. Um, and so it had to be translated to English. And the person who translated it was David Campbell, um, who uh, is um, is somebody who in the United States uh, was a political prisoner. In fact, 
he was arrested during protests and he he actually translated this book while in prison like he was yeah. like i think on i think in rikers when he was doing it so they would like send him the manuscript and they sent him a big like french to english dictionary and he like <laughs> type he like did it all out and then Wild. he would mail it out and they would mail him revisions then he'd make the revisions then he'd mail it out and there's a little fun like little introductory like little section preface uh that he writes that kind of lays out this um what his process of working on this which is so fascinating um so, you know, I think it's great. So um, this book kind of, you know, for, for such a, a brief volume, it hits a ton of notes. Mm -hmm. So you're going to learn, you learn about a variety of different thinkers and activists who have sort of walked the tightrope, if you will, between the sort of anarchist world and the Marxist world. And so, you know, the book kind of opens with, talking about the you know the legacy of the Paris Commune. And the Paris Commune was a revolutionary movement um, in 1871. Um, it was largely sort of a um, outgrowth of what was then called the Franco-Prussian War. Um, mm -hmm. The Franco-Prussian War was a large military conflict um, in 1871-ish. It ended in 1871. Um, which led to the development of modern Germany. So in the mid 19th century, a lot of nations, which were up to that point, were sort of small, sort of con confederacies of like small states that all had different interests, became nations. So Italy at that time in the 1860s becomes a full nation instead of just being the sort of collection of principalities and small sort of regional governments. Germany, it's the same thing in 1871, and the United States is one of those countries uh, with the Civil War in the 1860s. It goes from being sort of a loose confederation of states into being a nation. Um, it's really with the Civil War that we go from call, from go, saying the United States are to saying the United States is. Mm, and Franco, the Franco-Prussian War is very similar to that, where Prussia, which is sort of the um, northeastern part of Germany today um, was its own sort of principality, and it sort of invaded parts of what then was France and then made them Germany. Okay. So the Paris Commune was a sort of off, was sort of an outgrowth of this this revolutionary war like changing nationalist climate, and it was a government that lasted for about two months, um, and it was arguably the first working class government in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, and, uh, a lot of the people who were involved in the Paris commune, um, were anarchists and some were Marxist. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of overlap with a lot of the intellectuals at the time. A lot so of I'm lessons gonna, learned. <laughs> a lot of lessons learned. So I'm going to quote from the book here. So, um, they write, despite its short lived nature, only a few months, the commune of 1871 is an unparalleled case in the history of social revolutions, it was the first historical example of a, of a revolutionary worker's power, democratically organized, delegates were elected by universal suffrage, and doing away with the bureaucratic apparatus of the bourgeois state. It was also a profoundly pluralistic experience bringing together in one struggle Marxists, the term didn't exist yet, left Proudhonians, Jacobins, Blancists, and social republicans. So it was really this opportunity for the left to assert itself in a real political, in a, in a very overtly political way. Um, Marx would write about the commune um, in his classic work, The Civil War in France. A lot of anarchists would write about it as well, I think, including Bakunin and others. Um, and uh, there's a lot of affinity between, you know, as the book you know, says, affinity. There's a lot of affinity between the, the positive memories and the way that the commune is viewed both by Marxists and by anarchists. Um, yeah. And it, it plays very heavily in Marxist theory. As I said, he wrote the civil war in France. And then when Lenin wrote state and revolution, Lenin's referring constantly to the commune in state and revolution in reference to Marx's civil war in France. So the commune was a very important component of what would become, uh, you know, the, the great sort of, you know, coming together of the commune, 
but it also represented the great divide. So with the end of the commune really comes the end of the first international. So the International Working Men's Association, also known as the International, was sort of the first overtly left-wing group that was organized for the purposes of political activism and, and struggle. And there was a very, after the commune in 1872, there was a, a very vocal break. And this is where the Marxists kick out Bakunin, yeah. uh, Mikhail Bakunin, the, the, the anarchist philosopher. And they sort of kick the, the kick, they kick the anarchists to the curb. And the first international really reorganizes around Marxist lines. And then the international then kind of gets led by people like, um, you know, like Karl Kautsky and so on until the development of then the second international and the second international um, which of, of which Kowski was a part of and, and Rosa Luxemburg and others was explicitly Marxist. You know, the, you know, when we refer to something as the international, those always ended up being Marxist. Right. Um, the third international was, um, or the common turn was, um, was Stalinist in orientation. Um, and it was developed basically in the twenties and thirties. Um, you know, Trotsky was involved in the early days of it, but then eventually it sort of got, you know, overruled by the Stalinists, and then it eventually it eventually collapses. Um, and it it's not it actually in some respects actually ends up getting dissolved by Stalin before the Second World War. And so today, there's the Fourth International, which is largely made up of the Trotskyist movement. Um, and so that's but but the influence of the commune is very important in terms of how we think about politics, the idea of the the possibilities of revolution, yeah. but it also is a very big dividing line because. You know, really after the commune is when Marxists go on their path and anarchists go on theirs. And every once in a while, they'll kind of overlap, but never the twain shall meet. Like, not <laughs> in like a. In, yeah. Um, but yeah. For so, sure. uh, do we have any comments or questions? Oh, not really. No, I think everybody's just listening raptly to you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So the, so the next um, sort of – the first – the way the book is also organized too is you know, the first book, the first part of the book is sort of related to history. The second part of the book is really about sort of biographies of key leaders. And you have another part of the book which is about what they call points of conflict where it's like where Marxists and anarchists disagreed, sometimes even in violence. And then you have sort of some views on libertarian Marxists. And then it ends with a section devoted to policy issues and where anarchists and Marxists have some level of overlap. Okay. So, uh, what Clearly we'll do I didn't now, get that far. <laughs> no, you're okay. Um, the, the next thing we'll talk about briefly, cause we're going to go through the history section. Well, then we'll go through sort of talking about the biographies, points of conflict, and then we'll, we'll end with talking. I think about I got through the history and, uh, at some point there's letters being written to various, uh, people. Who oh are yeah, now, who are dead? <laughs> yes, so that that's the letter to Louise Michel, who was right. a organizer of the Paris Commune, um, and she was de she was very deeply involved in that. That one's written by Olivier, uh, Olivier Bessancino. Um, so, uh, so we'll briefly talk about the Haymarket riots um, hmm. or the Haymarket, um, the Haymarket revolt, the Haymarket affair, or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. So. Um, if the strike started on May 1st, 1886, um, the American, uh, it starts in Chicago. Um, the American unions had called for a general strike to demand the eight hour day. At that time, workers had to labor 10, 12, or 14 hours a day. Um, started on May 1st, 1886, and then the following days it spread and intensified. And most of the organizers of the Haymarket riot and those who would end up being killed with state violence were anarchists. They were anarchists in orientation. So you had leaders, people like, um, and a lot of them were immigrants. Um, um, a lot of them were, uh, you know, they were sort of like, um, you know, they, some of them were Jewish, some of them were Catholic, some of them were secular. Um, so you had people like August Spies, um, who was a German immigrant who discovered socialist ideas in America. He was a part of the Socialist Labor Party. Um, as it says here, he was an advocate of the collectivization of the means of production. Uh, Spies defined socialism or anarchism. The two terms were synonymous in his eyes as a form of universal cooperation that entailed the abolition of, cap of capitalism. 
Also, some of them were Civil War veterans in the case of Albert Parsons. Um, he was closer to Marxism, but he was a firm believer in anarchism, which he defined as the struggle against the domination of one human over another. And he situated anarchism as the opposite of what he designated statist socialism. So again, we're getting this clear dividing line. Yeah. Um, between those who really believe in socialism being this free association of all for all rather than necessarily going through the state. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there were other folks, you know, some of them were younger, but, you know, there's a, in the book, there's a great picture of all of the Haymarket organizers who were anarchists who were killed in the violence at Haymarket Square. Um, so the legacy of the Haymarket riots is, I think, quite large. Um, obviously, May Day, May 1st, being the International Day of the Working Person. The real ma- Labor the, Day. The real Labor Day, right. The Labor Day in the United States, where it's like the first Tuesday in September. Yeah, um, same here. <laughs> same uh, first Monday in September. Uh, and first got. Tuesday in September <laughs> here in the United States was, was I, think, I think it was instituted under Grover Cleveland. Okay. Which is pretty fucking rich, considering that he was somebody who put down the Pullman strike in 1894 and arrested Debs and Eugene Victor Debs during that. Um, and I think we've talked about that in a previous episode. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it was a way of, of taking it away from the real Labor Day, which is May Day. Yeah. Uh, ideally, I wish I had May Day off rather than Labor Day, but I won't necessarily be mad about getting a day off because who, do, who likes to work all the time? I don't. <laughs> That's right. Um. So the other thing that's very influential, and this goes into actually my own research as a labor historian, is how influential the Haymarket riots were on the labor organizer, Mother Jones. Mm -hmm. Um, This is not mentioned in the book, but I do think it's something to mention that it's rather important. Um, She she lived in Chicago. She she owned a sort of seamstress um, business. And uh, this was after all of her her parent, her father, no, sorry. This was after her husband and all of her children had died in a horrific, um, I think, uh, uh, cholera outbreak. So okay. she loses her husband and all of her children to a horrible disease. And she moves to Chicago and she's there for the Great Chicago Fire and she's there for the Haymarket Riots. So it's like the Great Chicago Fire, I think, is in 1871 or two and the Haymarket Riots are in 1886. But the Haymarket Riots and seeing how the anarchists were treated and, and how they were obviously killed um, as sort of martyrs to the cause of, of workers, uh, radicalized her and it, and it led her to do, uh, labor organizing and labor activism, which she'd do for the rest of her life. Um, and she would later go on to be an organizer with the United Mine Workers of America. And her politics were certainly radical. Um, but she was very ecumenical. And what I mean by that is that she, you know, there are times where she was more anarchist. There were times she was more Marxist. And then there are times later in life, she ends up being, after the influence of the Bolshevik revolution, she's more like a Leninist. Um, but she's radical and she, and she, and she owes it to the, the Haymarket, um, riots. And in the United States, there's a publishing company called Haymarket Books, which is based out of Chicago. Um, and so the legacy of the Haymarket, uh, uh, revolts and their martyrs is certainly there for sure. It's a big, uh, big part of history. Some random geek has a couple of comments. Uh, okay. May 1st, you mean loyalty day as in Eisenhower? <laughs> <laughs> Eisenhower created it in the fifties. Yeah. I'll briefly comment on that. So um, there's a lot of this that happens during the Eisenhower administration. You know, for those who don't know here in the United States, you know, the United States is national motto until the 1950s under Eisenhower was E pluribus unum, which is Latin for out of many one. That's, yeah. that's actually our national motto. And it's still in our money and it's still like you see it from time to time somewhere. And it's the one I really like because it's a, it's a, it's a message of tolerance and pluralism out of many one. Um, but in God, we trust has sort of become the motto of the United States. And that happened in the 1950s. You know, that was something that scare. it was the red scare, right? It was a way to fight the communists, the, yeah. the godless communists. So Eisenhower wasn't a particularly religious man himself, um, knew the sort of public use of religion. And used it to great effect. So this is where you get in God we trust on the money. This is where you get in God we trust on public buildings. It's also where you get under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yep. Um, which wasn't added until um, the 1950s. By the way, the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a Christian socialist. 
Um, it had a much more positive spin on it when it was written in the 1880s or 90s. Um, and uh, yeah, so all of these sort of symbols, loyalty oaths, the National Prayer Breakfast was started in the 1950s under Eisenhower. So a lot of this sort of tying God and government as a way of sending the United States away from the Soviets. So yeah. great point, some random geek. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. And uh, also we've got, uh, he says, I also read a bit on the Haymarket Massacre. A lot can be said about it. I will say this, fuck the police. Hashtag oh, absolutely. ACAB. <laughs> and, and yep. you know, and and I was just rewatching something about the Democratic Convention in 1968, which was also in Chicago, where um, protesters were brutally beaten and assaulted by police officers. And it was shown on national television, something I don't think right. we would ever see today uh, of a media class that's too sanitized for that. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, um, pigs in Chicago beating up innocent people. It's a it's a. It's now almost a national tradition at this point. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Um, and so, yeah, and ACAB. I guess j before we continue, uh, Non Sequently is here now. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate oh, it. Uh, before we continue, uh, thank you, Non Sequently, for becoming a new patron of the show. Hey, <laughs> thank you so much. Corey works so hard, and it will help him so much. And, and uh, you know, he is the guy. You know, I'm just – I come in here. You know, he's – you know, he is the Bill Moyers to my <laughs> Gore Vidal, okay? I'm the guy who comes in here and I will wax poetic on a book, but he's doing all the hard work. He's asking the hard questions, okay? <laughs> and uh, so thank you for being a patron. I appreciate it very much. Um, do we have any other comments before we move on? That, oh, uh, not consequently said thank you for what you do. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so... Uh, We'll move on and talk about uh, revolutionary trade unionism. So one of the ways in which I think anarchism and Marxism really come together well is the centrality of labor, obviously, but also like the centrality of labor organizing, labor organizations. So um, in Amiens, France in 1906, um, the Confederation Générale de Travail, or CGT, the General Confederation of Labor, um, and... Um, and they sort of developed what they would call the sort of charter of MEN. Um, and one, oh, one other thing I forgot to kind of mention at the outset is there's a word that this book uses frequently to describe anarchists or sort of people on the sort of libertarian left. And they're called libertaires, which is a French term. And right. it doesn't like directly translate to libertarian. And they're very clear about how like we would use the word libertarian normally. Um, but because of the way that libertarian is used in the United States, um, because libertarian in the United States is sort of a reactionary right wing. It's been ruined. Capitalist. It's been <laughs> ruined. Right. Um, and part of that is because the term liberal has been ruined. Right. So like liberal pre New Deal represented, you know, limited government and pro markets. And that's what liberal has always sort of meant in classical political philosophy. Um, so when someone calls himself like a classical liberal, that's what they mean by that. Um, and in liberal, in most parts of the world, that's what that means. Right. In, but since the New Deal, liberal in the United States has meant sort of like progressive or social democrat. Yeah. Um, so the libertarians can call themselves liberals anymore. So they had to call themselves libertarians. So libertaire is the term that the book uses a lot to refer to people on the sort of left libertarian end. Um, I am very much of the mind that we should take the term back um, and not give it up to people who make jokes about slavery on Twitter. Um, the libertarians and liber specifically the libertarian party is just made up of, of absolute reprobates. Um, I can't, I can't imagine, but the thing is, is that it's not really much of a jump between being a libertarian and being a fascist. Yep. Yeah. But, well, cause they essentially, they believe in, uh, uh, like corporate fascism, right? Like they just don't want any government interference in corporations ruling over everybody and, and running the world. So pretty much. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, um, the CGT or the general confederation of labor in France, you know, sort of evolved over many, many years from different organizations that eventually would come together. And their most sort of striking document was the charter of Amiens which was adopted on October 13th, 1906 at the ninth Congress of the CGT. Um, 
And so they were uh, basically, to quote the book here, a veritable profession of radical syndicalist faith. The charter was not only a declaration of the union's independence from the political parties, but first and foremost, a response to the reformist evolution of socialism of the day. So, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, there really was a a sort of reformist turn that happens in socialism, specifically in Marxism, um, from people like uh, Edward Bernstein, um, and Karl Kautsky, who argued that the way to sort of bring about socialism was to sort of slowly take over the state and sort of institute social democracy. And from there, you can sort of institute the sort of socialist world. And the CGT and the Charter of Amiens was like, no, 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 we don't want anything with that. We don't believe that because generally that will always end up in statism and in sort of subverting the real genuine wishes of the worker, which the 20th century has them, you know, absolutely correct on this mark. Yeah. That, you know, that the reformist movements can, the big problem with reformism in general is that it's very easy to pull away the reforms. For yeah. as difficult and painful and, and, and how hard it is to get the reforms done, it's very easy for them to go away. And the second thing is, is that reformism can then warp and evolve into um, just statism or in its worst forms like totalitarianism and Stalinism. So, right. you know, I think that, you know, the Charter of Amiens with the primacy, like the primacy of the union and the trade union, right? And this anarcho-syndicalist tradition that we organize workers through these syndicates of workers who will then make the decisions about society. I think that's very influential and would be proved to be very influential, most mostly on writers like George Sorrell and C.L.R. James, right. many of whom, and um, and uh, Daniel Guerin and many others, obviously Noam Chomsky, um, uh, you know, and Murray Bookchin and others who have argued for this kind of point of view. Some were Marxist in the in 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 the form of like Sorrell and James and to a greater or lesser extent Rosa Luxemburg, and some were more on the anarchist end like Chomsky. Um but yeah, I think that the the legacy of the um you know the legacy of of the the Charter of Amiens is, is big and I think it's very influential and is a part of that history. Kerrigan says, uh, don't forget about De Leonism. Yes, yeah. So Daniel De Leon, who was one of the organizers of the International Workers of the World um, with Big Bill Haywood and uh, Eugene B. Debs and Mother Jones. So yeah, De Leon was a component of that as well. Um, and a part of that reformist, you know, working through the sort of traditional channels of power, right? And that's the classic struggle, reform or revolution. Right. right. As Rosa Luxemburg framed it. And that's a book we'll be discussing later in the year, um, which I think will complement this book quite well. Um, so I think for uh, to kind of keep tr- try to keep us moving along here a little bit, um, I'm going to talk. We'll talk briefly about the Spanish Revolution and the, and the Spanish Civil War. Um, and so, you know, the the Spanish Revolution, the Spanish Civil War is really a moment where. Very much for the Marxists with the Bolshevik Revolution, the Spanish Revolution and, and the emergence of the Republic was a, a rallying cry for anarchists and, and you know, libertarian socialists or libertarians all over yeah. the world. And it was really a time where, you know, in the 1930s, it was sort of seen as the trial run for World War II the Spanish civil war, a lot of what the Nazis would end up doing in other parts of the world during World War II, they sort of did or tried to do in the Spanish civil war. And at the time, the governments of the world, whether it be Britain or the United States, were not particularly interested in the Spanish civil war. Roosevelt certainly wasn't. And, and he would go on to later say he regretted that decision. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of anarchists and socialists came together in various different organizations, um, like the Confederación Nacional de Trabajo or the CNT, which was Spain's version of the National Confederation of Labor, very similar to France. Um, and you know, this popular front was elected in the 1930s, and then fascist elements led by um, Francisco Franco attempted to seize power in 1936. And so for the next two or three years, um, there's a real conflict between those who support the, the, the Republic and support the sort of libertarian socialist vision that people wanted to set up, and um, the sort of the, the, the fascist ends of the Spanish Civil War. And one of the ways in which uh, the broader sort of Marxist left 
um, was an impediment to the success of the Spanish Republic and Spanish Revolution was Stalin and Stalin's um, inability to support um, the the sort of broader coalition of Trotskyists and anarchists and broader socialist Marxists who were fighting on behalf of the Republic um, against um, yeah. Franco. Now, I, I think it would be go so far to say that like Frank that like Stalin necessarily supported Franco, but basically he didn't support support he did not support the the I know like in the struggle. Yeah, I know like some of the stuff that I've read uh will say that the reason like that he essentially undermined the the movement against Franco. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And uh you know and 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 I think that um you know it, it, it's it's a real shame. I mean, if you really want, for those of you who want to learn more about this and really get into the weeds about it, um, I highly recommend reading George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, which is a book I read in college and uh, gives you really all these details about the Stalinist betrayal. Um, and I think that uh, because he fought as a part of the, the resistance against Franco. There was also a uh, a very well known American contingent that fought on behalf of the the Spanish Revolution called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, brigade um, which was which was made up of largely Marxists and, and anarchists. Um, so the Spanish Civil War, unfortunately, um, eventually it peters out, um, and uh, and um, of course Franco goes into power. And sadly, Franco would not would not only survive World War II. But he would maintain a grip on power until I think the 1970s. Right. Um, Spain did not really become genuinely a republic until the end. Um, um, and, some random yeah. geek has a quick comment here. Uh, the Spanish anarchist in Catalonia is a period time I would I want to study. I did enjoy Rudolf Rocker's book, Anarcho Syndicalism: Theory and Practice. Oh yeah, and and there's really there were really genuine attempts, very much like the Paris Commune, you know before it to build a real libertarian socialist society in Spain. Um, that was again, ultimately undermined by reactionary political forces in the form of Franco and the fascists and Stalin. Um, but yeah, I mean, then absolutely definitely check out homage to Catalonia. I think that's the book to read um, because it's, it's very accessible. It's Orwell, you know, being not just a good novelist, it's not a novel, but being a, a a journalist with a with a with a novelist's ear, it reads very well, and it's it's I think it's very insightful. Um, so yeah, definitely check that book out if you haven't read it. Um, and then uh, there are some other chapters devoted to May 1968 in France, and obviously the political revolts that happened in France in 1968, sort of this last gasp of radical political energies in France, um, nearly a century after the Paris Commune. And the influence that they would end up having um, on the rest of the world. Um, to quote the book here a little bit, to talk a little bit about it, um, they say that sort of you know uh, the de facto this de facto alliance between Marxists and anarchists also appear within the support for mass strikes, the most significant in modern French history in May 1968, in the occupations of factories, in the criticism of union bureaucracy, and obviously the French Communist Party. And in the drive to form strike committees. Um, so, you know, it was a really crucial time of self-organization that was, you know, unfortunately not as successful as it could have been, but was certainly, uh, I think, important. Um, then it goes into a chapter sort of talking about Occupy Wall Street, the anti-globalization movement. Um, I think the most important thing to mention here are those two events. So um, obviously uh, the 1999 WTO, WTO protests in Seattle yeah. are a very watershed moment, um, especially um, it's, a very, uh, it's a very important moment uh, where there is very much like in the 30s with Spain, a popular front where you have Marxist, anarchists, union, trade unionists. Um, you know, even progressives or liberals, all a part right. of this broader social movement to fight against the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Um, for those who don't know, the World Trade Organization was a precursor to what was called the GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, um, which had been organized um, some decades prior. And what the World Trade Organization did was these sort of what they quote, quote unquote, free trade movements. And they're not really free trade group movements. Right. Um, yeah, I think somebody who is the person who I've learned a lot about the, these particular um, uh, events and these currents has been is Noam Chomsky. Um, and he's given some great lectures and has written about this. But basically, the way the WTO was set up was it was this, you know, um, 
you know, it was this, uh, you know, this sort of corporate free for all where they could set the rules of the game in favor of big corporations, um, in, uh, at the expense of working people and the expense of the planet. Um, if you also want to learn more about the WTO and it's really pernicious, pernicious effect on the world, um, I highly recommend a documentary called the yes men, um, which is excellent. It's a two, two guys who are sort of comedians and political activists and performance artists who present an invention to, to a meeting of the WTO. That's absolutely absurd. And people actually believe it to be a true thing. Um, it's like a giant TV that like, it's like an inflatable TV that you can watch as you walk, but it's also coming out of your crotch. It looks like a boner as you're like walking, <laughs> but, um, it's really absurd, but the doc, the documentary is a really, really good explanation of what the WTO is and what the, the globalization movement has done to the, to the, just the immiseration of working people all over the world. I, you know, I think it's a great documentary to check out to learn more about it. And then, of course, Occupy Wall Street, which happens in 2011, 2012 here in the United States. Obviously, this is where we get the the sort of the 99% versus the 1%. Um, you get the sort of rattle, radical participatory democracy in the Occupy yeah. movement, of which David Graeber was a big part of. This is where you get the idea of the progressive stack or the you know organizing people's a bit a, people's um you know turn to speak you know and trying to make it more um you know egalitarian and then also like the ways in which they would sort of vote on things or that they would someone would say something and then they would keep repeating it and keep repeating it outwards so that everybody can hear it you know um you know i think my my criticism of occupy is really that unlike the tea party which obviously was a lot better organ was was more organized. A lot Part more of that well was funded. It was a lot more funded, right? Like they yeah. had the money. Yeah. But they also, in some respects, had the political vision. They knew what they kind of wanted to do. And I think the limitations with Occupy was that it it eventually didn't it, it didn't lead to something right away in the way yeah. that kind of the Tea Party did. Which but it, I will which say caused it to fizzle out. And- it kind of fizzled out. But one thing I will say is that the legacy of Occupy, I think, is very much um the the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016, um, and I think the emergence of more progressive members of Congress. I think that the legacy of Occupy is more in in the ref, in sort of the reformist electoral realm is that. But then I think in terms of the activist realm and the sort of non reformist route, I think it's that sense of radical democracy and 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 yeah. um, egalitarian decision making that is very influential. Um. Kerrigan had a comment. Uh, the France 1968 May strike uh, makes me think of the anarcho Maoists who participate in that strike. Funny enough. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so like you have this emergence of like uh, the the MLMs or the the Maoists at that time. And, and again, you know, May 68 is very similar to Occupy in that you have this you you have all of this pent up sort of political energy in the working class, and yet no real like program there's no real specific ask and so then it sort of fizzles out and obviously it leads to, you know the sectarianism of the left has always been one of its um it's been really one of its its weak points right um, you know, there was a there was a funny a very ironic clip of tucker carlson that went viral recently where he said he's like you know the left understands it's organized it puts its differences aside for a broader goal <laughs> and people thought like, and somebody yeah. commented on like, uh, this person clearly doesn't know anything about the left ever. Yeah. Uh, at any time, there have always been those divisions. I think some of those are for the good, right? Like, I think that taking a stand is a good thing. And I think like, but at the end of the day, I think one of the challenges has always been the specific asks. Um, so, so we'll go on and we'll start talking about some of the figures of the book that they talk about. So there's Louise Michel. Um, so Olivier Bessonsino writes a letter to her, sort of thanking her for her heroic actions during the Paris Commune. Yeah. Um, I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, he, uh, there's also a, um, you know, something written about Pierre Monat, who was also uh, uh, somebody who was involved in sort of the development of the CGT in France and, um, and so and sort of saw the Russian Revolution as the as a hope for the possibilities of class struggles in France. Um, but I really wanted to kind of move forward and talk about Rosa Luxemburg. Of course. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, because no disrespect to those other people, 
we're going to be talking about Rosa Luxemburg in a few weeks. So I wanted to tell you, to get, give you a little preview of what we're going to end up talking about. So Rosa the anarchist's Luxemburg. anarchist's favorite Marxist. The anarchist's <laughs> favorite Marxist, right? In many respects, one of my favorite Marxists. I have a tremendous amount of, of respect and love for Rosa, uh, Red Rosa, because she was somebody who, very similar to like George Sorrell and others, who, who made that essential blending of Marxist political economy and anarchist energies. I think putting those two together, she does in quite a brilliant way. Yeah. So I'm going to quote from the book here, uh, sort of that describes her anarchism. So she was never an anarchist. And in her writings, we find many criticisms of anarchist ideas. She always remained committed to the Marxist conception of the party as the political manifestation of the working class. But due to certain aspects of her thought and a revolutionary action, we consider her as being close to a libertarian culture, her critique of the bureaucratic authoritarianism at the heart of the workers' movement, her anti-militarism, her anti-nationalism, her confidence in the spontaneity of the masses, her insistence on a proletarian revolution from below, and her passionate defense of individual and collective freedoms are elements of this latent affinity. And this is absolutely right. I think that... Um, uh, for those of us uh, who um, are sort of of the non-Stalinist Marxist left, um, she is a she's a touch point, I think, for us yeah. all, because she foresaw so much of what would end up going wrong in the 20th century uh, in terms of the, the increasing bureaucratization of what were supposedly workers' movements, the emergence of totalitarianism and Stalinism, the re political repression of those who did not tow the party line or the official line of the government. The, and the belief in the, the problematic issues of vanguardism, the idea that you can sort of do a revolution from the top down. She was critical of all of them. And, um, you know, and so, you know, she was different than Lenin. Uh, very clearly. So as the book says, for Lenin, who at the time was the editor of the newspaper Iskra, the revolutionary spark is brought by the organized political vanguard from the outside to the inside of the spontaneous struggles of the proletariat. For Rosa Luxemburg, it was the opposite. Yeah. She was a revolutionary Polish Jew, and she believed that the spark of consciousness and revolutionary spirit will itself flare up in the struggle and the actions of the masses. So this is where she's very influential on George Sorrell, who was another sort of um, libertarian Marxist who believed in this too in his book, um, Reflections on Violence. He sort of believed that revolutionary struggles would be from below and that we would we that, that the revolutionary mass would be the ones who would really carry it out um, as opposed to vanguardism. Um, and she was a leader uh, of the left wing of the Social Democratic Party in Germany, the SPD or the SPD. Um, and she genuinely believed in the value of workers. Um, she saw the Russian general strike of 1905 as an example to follow in Germany as well. She had more confidence in the initiative of the working class base than in the quote unquote wise decisions of the governing bodies of the German labor movement. Unfortunately, Rosa Luxemburg's story does not end happily. Um, she is murdered in 1919 along with her partner and collaborator, Karl Liebknecht, um, who uh, during the sort of revolutionary uprisings in Germany. Um, some have argued that possibly she was murdered by people on the right faction of the SPD, or she was sort of murdered by what would become known as the Brown Shirts. Um, there's a good book about it. Um, I think called just, I think it's just called the murder of Rosa Luxemburg, but um, that's also a documentary. And uh, her, the, the revolution in Germany never came to pass. What eventually happened was the establishment of the Weimar Republic, mm. which was a rather weak and ineffectual government who could not stave off the tide of fascism and Adolf Hitler. But I think her example is one that we can all learn from. And I believe that she is, uh, if there's one Marxist that you're allowed to like, if you're an anarchist, it's her. Yeah, um, right. I, I, I think that, you know, she's the one that, you know, you can be like, okay, you're cool. You're part of, you're part of the, <laughs> yeah. you're part of the club. Like she's, she's great. Um, to talk about another revolutionary woman who I think is very important is to talk about Emma Goldman. Obviously. 
So we've talked about Emma Goldman before on the podcast. We've, yeah. we've, we've done podcasts devoted to Emma Goldman. Um, you know, she was, um, an immigrant to the United States. Um, she was very radical politically as well as socially. Um, so she, um, you know, she learned from the great sort of rhetorical traditions of 19th century America. So she, you know, there's hints of, you know, the, the, you know, the Fanny Wright and the, the early workers movements and, and the, the sort of garment workers in, in you know, Lowell, Massachusetts in, in the 1800s. And there's a whiff of Ingersoll, Robert Ingersoll, the late 19th century order. I've, I've spent most of my adult life studying and writing about, um, who she saw as an influence. And, you know, I've written about Emma Goldman's radical political humanism before. So if you want to learn more about Emma Goldman, check out my blog on her, on her sure. and her revolutionary form of humanism. Um, but Goldman really believed in the power of abandoning these strictures against society, which were so oppressive, not just to workers, but to women. And she centralizes the, the problem um, of that. So, you know, her bigger influences were not Marx um, and were actually not Bakunin, but actually right. Peter Kropotkin. Yeah. Kropotkin is probably, you know, her clearest political influence, not her rhetorical one, but her clear political influence. She would set up a magazine in the United States called Mother Earth, which ran for many years, where she published on a variety of topics. Um, she was somebody who came out very early on in support of what at the time they called free love or basically the, the ability to, you know, have you know, different partners. Um, uh, she was very much in support of birth control movements, uh, and, and the right uh, of women to choose. And she was somebody who very much believed in all of that. Um, um yeah. Kerrigan has a comment. There needs to be an epic rap battle of history between Emma Goldman <laughs> and Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> I often think about this, you know, so, you know, cause obviously like Bakunin and Marx knew each other, right? They worked right. together in the international but I don't know if Emma Goldman ever met Rosa Luxemburg. I don't think so. Um, but that would have been a great meeting. You know, you, wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall for that? To, for sure. to have them in the same room, right? Um, so uh, she eventually leaves the United States um, due to being accused of, you know, assassination attempts on President McKinley and being tied in with the anarchist movement. And she goes to Soviet Russia. And she says, there's the possibility of, of what we could build here. And, uh, pretty quickly her and her partner and collaborator, Alexander Berkman, uh, they pretty much go, okay, no, this has gone South pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> We're so, <out> of here. <laughs> so she wrote a whole book about it called my disillusionment with Russia. And, um, as we've talked before, I think on the, on the Propotkin podcast that the last time that, um, that anarchists were allowed to publicly organize was with the death of Kropotkin, um, I think in 1919, 1920. Um, but she did meet Lenin. Um, and uh, um, so she and Sasha, um, which I think is in reference to one of her other collaborators, um, whose name might be, I'm not exactly sure if that's Alexander Berkman or not, but yeah, yeah, it's Alexander Berkman. Yeah, Sasha. So like many, yeah. Um, so she and Sasha, meaning Alexander Berkman, were received by Lenin when they came to the Soviet Union. Um, and he expressed great admiration for them and compared them to Malatesta, who was another influential anarchist radical figure, who, according to Lenin, was entirely with Soviet Russia. What is it you prefer to do? He asked them. The two proposed the creation of a support committee for radical struggles in America, and Lenin was delighted with this brilliant idea. Um, Unfortunately, obviously, this went south pretty quickly. Um, they were very, very unhappy with how everything was starting to go. Kropotkin's funeral was in February of 1921, and that was the last time that a massive public demonstration of anarchist opinion happened in the Soviet Union until its collapse. So in late 1921, she and Berkman were granted visas by the Soviet authorities to attend an anarchist congress in Berlin and used the opportunity to leave the USSR for good. And so ended an emblematic episode of the convergence between anarchists and communists in the first years after the October Revolu Revolution. Um, Emma Goldman published My Dissolution in Russia a few years later, which I mentioned earlier, which bitterly summed up her personal experience. She eventually would move to England, and then at some point she would end up in Canada, and she died in 1940. Um, so she was somebody who saw the long sweep of the changes of the political movement and um, is, like many anarchists, um, quickly saw the sort of disillusion and degradation of the workers' movement as it evolved in the Soviet Union, not just under Stalin, 
but under Lenin. And right. she was very critical of Lenin. So, so yeah, so that's uh, Emma Goldman. There's a couple other figures here I'm going to talk about. So there's uh, Buenaventura de Rudy, who was one of the um, Spanish uh, freedom fighters during the Spanish Civil War. There's a great picture of him with his hat. Rudy is um, like a, a superhero almost like if you yeah. <laughs> some <of> the, <laughs> like some of the stories. But. He is pretty cool. Uh, you know, as the book says, many young men and Durruti included faced with repressive violence from the bosses, arbitrary harassment and systematic arrests designed to organize themselves into small determined activist, determined anarchist groups acting beyond the boundaries of normal union activity. For Durruti, this mostly meant robbing banks to finance the union and engaging in armed resistance against the Pistoleros, the militias backed by the bosses. These were his main activities for nearly five years until 1922. So he's like, he's kind of <laughs> like, like, cause Stalin did the same thing. Like Stalin robbed banks too, but you know, Stalin ended up being Stalin. <laughs> it's a different, you know, whereas like with, <laughs> yeah, with right. that, you know, um, but it pro- he proved to be an excellent organizer. Um, he was very much involved in the Federacion Anarchista Iberica, the FAI and the CNT, which is that, National Confederation of Labor, like in France, in the CNT in Spain. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and basically he was somebody who um, he believed, uh, as it says here, in the emancipatory power of, power of class struggle, but he also believed in the importance of the role of the organization in carrying out the revolution. It was anarchist, anarchism's duty to be a system of thought and perpetual motion, to call itself to question and perfect itself through the experiences it accumulated as it went along. This is very, this is where it feels like very Marxist to me, where he's, it's like a historical materialist perspective where you're, you're sort of surveying the materialist conditions and reassessing your, your, um, policies or your plans as you're going along. I mean, obviously anarchists can do that too, but I think that might be a little bit of the anarchist mark, uh, influence. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and of course, as it says here, he would be betrayed by Stalinism. Um, and, uh, Trotsky who felt no particular affection for the Spanish anarchists, nonetheless recognized the CNT with Duridi, Duridi as the main revolutionary force where the most combined elements of the proletariat had gathered. And there's a great, it's a great line from him that I want to read, which is, it's only by freeing itself from fear that society can build itself in freedom, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it's it's almost like Rooseveltian in its rhetoric. You know, the <laughs> right. only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But freeing itself from fear that society can build itself in freedom. I think that's a beautiful way of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then obviously there's sub subcomandante Marcos. Um, who was a leader of the Zapatista movement in Spain. Um, and uh, he was a part of what they call Ejercito Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. Um, he did not come out of the Libertarian Matrix. He was one of the founders of the National Liberation Forces, the Guevarist armed organization. Um, but eventually he would develop the Zapatista movement, these sort of radical, um, you know, radical uh, places within the indigenous Maya of Chiapas in Mexico. And I think subcommandante Marcos has a very interesting style. Who's he's got a flair for the dramatic, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of an interesting cat, you know, he's, you know, and, and he's very eclectic in his ideas and in, and in his tactics. So Marcos mm-hmm. is an interesting figure um, for sure. But for the, for the sake of time, we'll keep moving forward. So there <laughs> are points, there are points of conflict. Um, the points of conflict are mostly, with, with very little surprise, mostly about the Soviet Union. Right. Um, so the first is talking about the Russian Revolution. Um, for those of you who want a full play-by-play of the Russian Revolution, check out our episode where we talk about two books related to the Russian Revolution. Um, but uh, I'm going to kind of sum up, you know, some of this with what, you know, Daniel Guerin, the great sort of anarchist who was influenced by Marxists, wrote about um, – you know, Garin dates the end of the Bolsheviks' libertaire period at the spring of 1918 and explains it by the dualism of Marxist ideas about the state, which Lenin summed up in September 1917 in his book, The State Revolution. The two extremes, two t- contradictory concepts cohabitated in Marxist thought, a libertaire version that clearly wanted to abolish the capitalist state and an authoritarian version that preferred to establish the establishment of a new Marxist state, which was supposed to fade away on its own, but lived endlessly on. And so there was, um, you know, there was a real, there was a real divide, you know, so early on, you see a lot of 
liberatory movements. You know, so you see the development. You know, like they legalize abortion, they decriminalize homosexuality, they um, continue to maintain opposition political parties and political journal and political newspapers and political organizing, and that really starts to go away with the Russian Civil War. Mm. So, um, for Marxists and particularly those of the Leninist bent. Um, they would argue that like part of the reason why there was such a crackdown on opposition political parties was directly in response to the fact that half the fucking world had just invaded them to destroy their worker government. <laughs> right. So, you know, there's a certain part of like, well, they kind of had to do it, but, but, yeah. but, you know, and so maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I, I, I kind of lean on it's probably not, but in the sense that like, you know, what's really more of a problem, these other countries coming to invade you or some anarchist newspaper that might talk some shit. I mean, I would, right, right. you know, and so I think that was the real issue. Yeah. The trouble I, I always, I kind of think of it is like the labeling of everyone who is opposed to you as the forces of reaction or like, you know, like you see, uh, similar things from right wingers now where like anybody who disagrees with them is an outside agitator or you know, right. working yeah. for such and such group or, you know, it's, 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 it's almost very- dishonest and just a way to shut down dissent. Right. And, you know, and, and, um, and for a long time, there was a tremendous amount of goodwill from a variety of different factions in the left for the Russian Revolution, you know, from the anarchists to Eugene Debs to Mother Jones, you know, in the US to, you know, obviously, Rosa Luxemburg, and, uh, you know, some of the French anarchists. But at some point, it sort of starts to devolve and it devolves due to the, the Russian Civil War. The development of the Cheka, which was the sort of the Soviet secret police, which would evolve into the NKVD, which would evolve into the KGB. Then you have like the obviously the the getting rid of the the Congress of Dep- like the Congresses. So you have the the constituent assemblies get shut down, and then eventually the Soviets are largely just be kind of become sort of hollow shells of their former selves. And by the night the by Lenin's death in 1924, we are on a very different path than than where we started. And so I think anarchists are right to point out the failures of the Russian Revolution, um, and um, and so you know, and and so you know, at, at first Lenin was favorable to them, but then over time it sort of fell apart. Um, and as the book writes, in hindsight, it appears that between Lenin's pro-Soviet period and the war communism period, a bond was broken. And not only in the treatment of libertaries, the early policy of self-management had gradually been swept aside under the drastic requirements of the war effort, allowing the bureaucratic wolf in sheep's clothing to enter the fold of the revolution. So that's where you basically, once you get into the development of state socialism in the, the late 1920s into the NEP and then eventually into the five-year plans in Stalin, we're far beyond where, where anybody would have wanted to be if you were on the sort of libertaire left. Right. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, but, you know, and so I think this is where the lessons that we take away from this is from the book, they write, building anti-bureaucratic revolutionary organizations is one of the strongest guarantees for any revolution to guard against authoritarian drift. Revolutionary forces must fill a vital function, helping the revolution make the necessary decisions at the right moment. But effective power in the final analysis comes down to structures of self-organization. And so over time, the, the Russian Revolution went away more and more from that self-organization of the Soviets and the workers to becoming more and more about the party bureaucracy and, and the authority on high. And then it developed into the sort of largely top down command economy and society that would exist until 1991. Um, The other thing that we'll mention briefly in this section is the Kronstadt tragedy. Um, So Kronstadt was another one of these big inflection points that led to a division between anarchists and Marxists. Um, the Kronstadt insurrection and its repression by the Soviet state in 1921, they write, has been a bone of contention between libertarians and Marxists, and in particular between anarchists and Trotskyists for nearly a century. So um, there was a, a, a variety of delegates in uh, 1921 um, who organized their own Kronstadt Soviet, um, but then they were put under arrest. Mm. Um, 
And in March 5th, the Soviet leadership, Lenin and Trotsky, delivered an ultimatum to the insurgents and declared a state of siege at Petrograd. Um, the siege would go on for a number of days. Um, and then eventually, by the 18th of March 1921, the Red Army succeeded in recapturing Kronstadt at a cost of heavy losses on both sides. 2,000, 2000 insurgents were taken prisoner, some shot on the spot, others shot in the prisons of the Cheka over the following months. Several hundred, according to um, writer and author Victor Serge. Um, so there are many different ways of looking at the Kronstadt tragedy. So from the perspective of Lenin and Trotsky, they saw the Kronstadt rebellion as, as a counter-revolutionary move right. and it had to be quelled in order to save the emergence of the Soviet Union. On the other side, you have the the anarchists who basically argue that any any semblance of workers' government was done and that by and by Trotsky and Lenin's decision to invade Kronstadt and put down the rebellion was the death of the revolution. And it was the death of all of what the Russian revolution was supposed to represent. Yeah. And so the authors basically come to the conclusion that it's somewhere in the middle. That's okay. kind of where they argue. Okay. So here's what they write. In our view, the conflict between Kronstadt and the Bolshevik government is not a fight between revolution and counter-revolution, a claim common to both sides, with each reversing the roles of the protagonists, but a tragic and frat fratricidal confrontation between two revolutionary currents. Mm. And I think some of that, I think there's some, some I think there's some truth to that um, in yeah, the sense that if, if one's um, being generous or like, if one's being generous, yeah, you could say I that. think that this is true. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I think it was two very clear conf conflicting visions yeah, that's, of what that's this was great. supposed to be, right? And, and so one won out, and, and it was the one that was backed by Lenin and Trotsky. Part of that's just because Trotsky was a, kind of a brilliant military mind um, right. and was quite good at being able to win. Um, you know, he's sort of the George Washington of the Soviet Union. You know, he's sort of the, the sort of revolutionary figure who sort of rallies the troops. Although he won more battles objectively than Washington did. Okay. But, um, but yeah, anyway, so that's sort of the Kronstadt tragedy. I know there's a variety of different writings on this. I think it's a very, this chapter is very interesting and we could get more into the weeds at another time, but um, I want to, I want to try to touch as most of this. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Some random geek uh, says anarchists can be friends with Marxists easily in my mind, but anarchists are only allowed one Trotskyist friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, what's crazy is like, I, I have so much like affinity with like Trotsky, the thinker, like, right? and sort of Trotsky, the, the political theorist and tactician, but I'm not a Trotskyist. I mean, I, I think that like, you know, I mean, I have more respect for them than say like, you know, tankies, but, but, um, but Trotsky, I mean, I, I very much kind of accept, you know, as a Marxist, I kind of accept the Trotskyist view of the Soviet Union, which is that, you know, it was this revolution, which had obviously very big conflicts. We've just described some of them that did not go, I think, the way maybe they could have or should have. But ultimately, it was a, it was a genuine attempt at a workers' government that then, then became perverted and undermined by the forces of reaction and bureaucratization. I think that's true. Um, um it had to be said, says the stuff Trotsky did should cross him off the reading list, frankly. Frankly. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, right? That's yep. fair. I mean, I think like, and I think it's this healthy, I think it's a very healthy discussion to be had versus the, you know, the, 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 the theorist versus the tactician, right? You know, Lenin, the theorist was very different from Lenin, the tactician. So mm -hmm. was Trotsky. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I once uh, said on, uh, yeah. uh, I once said on, I mean, Twitter is what it is, but. I once said, like in a conversation, that uh, Lenin was has said a lot of things that I really like, but mm -hmm. uh, then he didn't follow through on a lot of them. <laughs> right, right. So I often compare it to, you know, and in that regard, I guess he was being a politician, right? So you right. think of somebody. I, my go-to example in the U.S. is somebody like John F. Kennedy. You know, John F. Kennedy was sort of had all this sort of lofty liberal rhetoric, and when you heard him, you were like, "Well, hell yeah, I'm on board with that. That sounds great." But then, but then when he governed, he basically governed from the center right yeah. and his politics were nowhere near as sort of uh, visionary as his rhetoric. There was a huge gulf between him as a rhetorical figure and as a as sort of a 
for lack of a better word, like a theorist of democracy versus what he actually did. Um, I think another go-to example of our own time is Barack Obama. Yeah, you know, I think yeah. Barack Obama is a good example of this, right? Yeah, Where it really did this sort speak of, of yeah. big ideas and wonderful, re- like reformal, like change. And, and uh, had a theory of democracy and sort of a theory of change, and then comes yeah. into power and sort of governs from the center. You know, you know, some would argue the center left. I would argue more from the center, maybe even center right. But, um, but Obama, it's that difference between the rhetoric and reality. Yeah. That's why I think it's really important when we're evaluating political texts to get a sense of like, well, what did these people do too? Right. 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 Like Rosa Luxemburg, like unfortunately didn't live long enough to see a lot of what she could have done or would have done, but she basically tried to lead a revolution in Germany and they killed her for it. Yeah. Yeah. Which in my estimation is what, what the kids call based. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, not her dying of course, but her leading a revolt and, and, and the only way they could stop her was to kill her. That's pretty based. Yeah. Same like um, Daruti was pretty fucking. Exactly. Based. I don't right. know if I'm using that right. But I'm, an you know, old pretty, you know? <laughs> I'm an old man, right? But like pretty exceptional. Like, you know, I think exemplary is a good yeah. way to describe it, you know, um, to use like a SAT word, but like, but yeah, I think that, you know, those figures, whereas with Lenin, he's a much more complicated figure. And right. so is Trotsky, right? Because, you know, there's this great um, quote. I, I think it's I think it's attributed to Fier- Fiorello LaGuardia, who's the mayor of New York. Maybe maybe it's Mario Cuomo, who said, you know, you you um, you uh, politic and poetry and you and you govern in prose. And I think that's true. I, I think that that's very true. I think that the rhetoric and ideology that often comes out of revolutionary movements is very is not always not it it now not it sometimes doesn't live up to what it could be in the moment, and that's for that's for a variety of reasons, right? Like it's historical contingencies, political contingencies, trying to build alliances, doing politics, you know. Yeah. As I always say, you know, like, you know, um, you know, one of my favorite. The worst thing about politics is politics. <laughs> is politics, right? You know, um, uh, as, uh, you know, as Gore Vidal wrote in one of his best plays, which is about politics called The Best Man, one of the, the characters says, you know, politics is not a toy to be played with. It's a weapon that you yield. And that's true. I mean, I think like, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, there's a part of that that's true, right? Like. The politics is not necessarily like this rosy fucking business. Like sometimes it can be truly dirty and you have to do things that in the, in the short term seem pretty terrible, but for long term reasons that might be good. The thing is, is, and I think this is very important is that whole ends justifying the means. Yeah. Well, as I've heard before, pretty like to, yeah. all we have is means. Yeah. We right. don't have ends. All we have is means. So I think it's, I think it's a very healthy discussion. And if you use had. the wrong, if you use the wrong means, you will not achieve the ends that you wish. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I think it's, I think it's extremely relevant to, to, you know, to highlight that. Um, so, uh, again, there's just so much good in this book. Great conversation we're having. I'm enjoying it. Really appreciate the comments and the questions. Um, but I want to make sure we we get done within the next 10, 15 minutes. I'm trying to get this within a relatively <laughs> manageable length. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk. So there's a section about libertarian Marxist thinkers. I'm going to really focus on two. They write about three, but I'm going to write. I'm going to talk about two. One is uh, uh, Walter Benjamin um, or Walter Benjamin. Um, I always say his name Benjamin because that's how it's supposed to be said because he's German or whatever. Um, Walter Benjamin was a uh, uh, was a writer. He was an essayist um, who brought an element of surrealism into political ideal ideology and into Marxism. Okay. And as they write about him, they sort of talk about um, Walter Benjamin occupies a unique place in the history of modern Marxist thought for his ability to incorporate elements of the Romantic critique of civilization, the Jewish messianic tradition, and anarchist thought into the theory of historical materialism. Indeed, he sought to articulate, combine, and fuse anarchist and communist ideas, Marxist communist ideas. Um, and so, yeah, I think he's a very interesting character. Um, I have a couple of over here somewhere, where maybe over here. I have a couple of Walter Benjamin books. Um, I think we will do one of them at some point because I think cool. he's a very interesting guy, and I think we'll we'll talk about some of his very influential essays. Um, he wrote a really great essay about like 
the, the change of production in the technological society. He wrote a he wrote a like theses on history, which are really interesting. Um, but he's somebody who b- combines a lot of different threads of thought into one, and it, it makes for I think a very interesting thinker. And he's somebody who I'm looking forward to learning more about. My friend Nick, um, who is a World War II historian who teaches at um, the University of Munster in Germany, is kind of a he's kind of a Benjamin buff. So oh, yeah. I'm gonna like kind of I'm pivoting to him and being like, okay, like am I getting this interpretation right? Because he knows a bit more about Benjamin than me. Unfortunately, I should have been reading Benjamin in college when I was reading Heidegger. I don't really like Heidegger very much. First off, he was a Nazi. Yeah, first off, I was, he's a Nazi. And and he has like, and basically, he just like wants everybody to like live on a farm. And I'm like, no, thank you. That, that sounds awful. Um, um, but I yeah. was just looking that up today because I uh, I was thinking, I don't know, I was thinking about Heidegger and I was just looking yeah. up like, wait a second, wasn't he a Nazi? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a Nazi. Yeah, Heidegger was a Nazi. And he wasn't one of those where it's like a Werner von Braun situation where it was like, well, I wanted to continue to do science and this was the only way I could without being persecuted. So I kind of swallowed the, the, the bitter pill and made it work as best I could, but I got out as fast as I could. It wasn't like that. It was much more of a, no, I'm cool. No, I'm cool <laughs> with this. This is fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Not cool, actually, but yeah. Not cool. Yeah. Not cool at all. Um uh, the second person I want to talk about is somebody that we will be doing one of his works later. Not We were going to do it this year, but I think I'm pushing it to next year, and that's Daniel Guerin. Okay. Um, and Daniel Guerin is somebody who's fascinating to me. I first learned about him uh, through um, Michael Perenni, actually. So Perenni cites him in Black Shirts and Red. So when we were talking about the melding of like big business in the corporate state with government in that episode way, way back. Um, that is a book that like he, he pulled a lot from Daniel Guerin's book, fascism and big business. Um, and Guerin was somebody who was very much influenced by Marxism, who ended up becoming sort of this anarchist Marxist. Right. He was really working towards the sort of grand synthesis of Marxism and anarchism. Um, as they write in the book, a writer, he was the author of over 20 works, historian of emancipatory movements and unwavering militant of the anti-colonial struggle and the LGBTQ cause. He was also one of the most foremost anarchist thinkers in France to be receptive to the synthesis between Marxism and anarchism. Um, and he supported it, you know, anti-colonialist struggles from Indochina to Algeria. He was, uh, he corresponded with Trotsky and he founded the movement communiste libertaire in 1971 um, and so we uh, we'll do his book Anarchism probably sometime in 2024, um, oh. uh, because I'm very excited. But if we get overwhelming demand, like if you throw it, like you know, hit that like button and subscribe, and then <laughs> put in the comments like, "Hey, we'd like you to do Daniel Guerin sooner rather than later." I'll move yeah. the schedule around for Let's you. Do that um, to make that work, because um, I think he's very interesting, and I think. As my own politics evolve, I find myself moving more and more to characters like Benjamin and C.L.R. James and, and, and Garen, where it's the sort of fusion of Marxism and anarchism, that they need not be enemies, that, but that they can be um, worked together. The last section of the book um, is basically about sort of um, broader points of policy. So we'll kind of go through some of this quickly. Um, but basically, there's a chapter called Individual and Collective. Um, where they talk about, um, you know, basically that there's this sort of crude version of collectivism as they write, barracks communism denied the individual, limiting him to the to his obligations to the apparatchiks of the state under the guise of serving the community. And basically, they say that's kind of nonsense. And so people write about it different ways. So we'll, so Daniel Guerin's first, in particular, quote, uh, suggests that there is a complementary relationship between the individual and the collective. And that's pretty much what I believe in, too. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty much what uh, Mikhail Bakunin believed in, too. Um, all, to quote Bakunin, all social life is simply this continual mutual dependence of individuals and the masses. Yeah. Right. And in some respects, this is very Hegelian, right? Like Hegel writes about this, like to know, to really tr- truly know yourself is only in relationship to others. And so, like, this sort of weird divide that we have, like, individualism versus collectivism, this very weird, like, sort of Ayn Rand bifurcation of the world, which right. is nonsense, 
I think it's like, no, like a good society, like the society that we would want to live in is one where we do have duties to each other and that they fulfill our individual destinies, that they fulfill what we wish for ourselves. Then in building a, in building healthy collectives of revolutionary struggle, that we then create the conditions by which we want to live the best lives that we can live as individuals, Um, which is kind of the vision. I mean, it's essentially kind of the vision that they argue for. I I think, I think it's just uh, pretty plain that the dichotomy is false, right? (laughs) Yes. It's just, I don't know where it came from, why we got this separation between collectivism and individualism, but it's just wrong. It just isn't that way. Exactly. There's a section where they talk about a writer named John Holloway who's written about the Zapatistas. He has a book called um, Change the World Without Taking Power, where they talk about you know power to versus power over. So um, there's a distinction. So power to is the ability to get things done. So like the power to do this, the power to do that, and power over, the power to command others. And um, revolutions, according to Holloway, must promote the former, power to, um, and suppress the latter power over. So then in a healthy society, we would get away from the power over to building institutions, whether it's power to. Yeah. Um, and uh, now they sort of don't necessarily buy that. So, cause they're, they're, they're sort of that they don't think that's necessarily the way it could work. So they mm-hmm. argue, um, we think on the contrary, that democracy should be a central feature of all social and political decision-making processes. Um, and especially revolutionary ones, a thesis outstandingly argued by Rosa Luxemburg in her fraternal critique of the Bolsheviks in 1918. Um, so in Holloway's book, there's just not much mention of democracy whatsoever. It's mostly just okay. about like power divisions, but you know, it doesn't really matter that much power to versus power over. If there's no mention of, if there's no sense of democracy um, and democracy, is such an incredible component of that. Um, they also say the principal objection we have to the concept of power developed by Holloway is it's extremely abstract character. It's basically, it's very, very abstract. There's mm. no real concrete nation, notion of what Holloway's getting at. And so, uh, so what they basically say is that the way around this is a sort of um, council communism or sort of a form of libertarian Marxism. Um, so they sort of talk about Anton Panacek, who was a severe critic of Lenin who wanted all power to the workers' councils, and he conceived of the councils as a means for the workers to seize power and establish their mastery over society. Um, And broadly, thinking about Marx, Marx's answer is that through their own emancipatory praxis, people change society and change their own consciousness at the same time. Any self-emancipatory action, individual or collective, however modest, must be a first first step towards revolutionary um, transformation. So I think there's some there's some lessons to be learned from Hallway, but that basically, especially that power to versus power over distinction. Yeah, like I don't see that as as necessarily uh, separate from democracy, right? Like, yeah, democracy gives the people the power to. <laughs> yes, <Right>? exactly. <laughs> I think, and I think that the what what the authors of our book are talking about is that like. In Holloway's book, he sort of mentions democracy in passing, but mostly in sort of a liberal okay. bourgeois way and kind of dismisses it. But what we're actually arguing for is a revolutionary democracy, like but really, really taking democracy to mean what it should actually mean, which right. is not just going into a fucking voting booth and picking some you know momentary master of the some capitalist dip class. who happens to yeah you know he'll do whatever he wants for a few bucks. It's just pretty much it's yeah, and so um, there's a lot about in the book uh, about sort of like um, divisions about like autonomy and federalism and how we should sort of figure out how to de-hierarchy politics. Um, And then there's also stuff about like economic planning and self-management. So this is where they start talking about like somebody like Ernest Mandel, who was a really influential leader of the fourth international Trotskyist um, who wrote extensively on um, Marx and particularly Marx's economic thought. I have one of his books over here. Um, but, and sort of talking about the development of sort of decentralized, um, structures. Um, and so, but what they're arguing for is something closer to what the writer Michael Albert talks about is what they call participatory economics or paracon. 
if that's a term any you or if any of you have heard before Paracon. Um, but basically it's, it's, um, you know, it's moving towards planning. Yeah. Yep. I'm yeah. There we that. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paracon. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so it's, it's, and, and so, um, now, now the two authors are a little critical of this as they write, Albert's model returns to currently existing structures of technology and production and is to econ- economists to take into account the sociopolitical and socio-ecological interests of the population, the interests of individuals as human beings and citizens living in a threatened and natural environment who cannot be reduced solely to their economic interests as producers and consumers. And I think that's a fair critique of Michael Albert, like in the sense that he's sort of too economistic, that he's taking the realm of history and and the history of politics because mm. like economy can't be separated from politics. I'm sorry. Right, right. It can't be, you know, in the 18th century, they called it political economy for a reason. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the economy is political and whether you call it participatory or not, economics are still going to have politics involved in them. Yeah. And I think Albert's vision is, well, if we can get our economic system to be participatory enough, we don't have to have that pesky thing called politics. And I just don't fucking buy that. Yeah, like, I guess I, it depends what you mean by politics. Politics, right? yeah. yeah, like maybe if politics. Yeah. If politics means like you know continuing like the bourgeois state, then yeah, maybe we should get rid of it. But if politics means like the collective discussion and organization of right. society, then that's, then yeah, you, that's, that's the only way to exist. Politics, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they have a they have a section um, talking about sort of direct versus representative democracy. So they say, you know, revolutionary Marxists are in agreement with the anarchists that it is not through these institutions like bourgeois states that we will be able to transform society. Um, should they, under these conditions, participate in the electoral spectacle, present present candidates, vote, and be elected? For Marxists, yes. Insofar as electoral campaigns with their obvious limits are a rare occasion for them to present their analyses and proposals to the wider population. Um, and then, but, and then the sort of, and as they write, of course, none of these practices is acceptable to those anarchists to refuse all forms of participation in state institutions. And their final conclusion is again, kind of what we're going to get out of this section of the book is basically they're laying out the best case about all the libertarian stuff. And how much they largely agree with a lot of it. Right. But in the end, they're still Marxists. And here's why. So um, so basically they say our point of the view in this debate is closer to the Marxist tradition. Or at the very least, if they're not Marxists, they're closer to Marxism. But we recognize that even the most radical Marxist organizations are not immune to the dangers of electioneering and parliamentarism denounced by the anarchists. And that's true. I mean, I think that um, – I mean, just look at the squad, right? Yep. Like AOC is like my go-to example on this. You know, she didn't change the Democratic Party. The Democratic changed Party her. changed her, yeah. right? And so, you know, I find in many respects, you know, she's she's certainly better than a lot of members of Congress, certainly more on the progressive end, but she does not have the kind of revolutionary fire or, or sort of even broader social democratic fire she had when she came into Congress. I uh, um, I have a yeah. uh, an interview that I'm working on that's coming out soon with Zoe Baker on mm-hmm. uh, her her recent book Means and Ends, and mm-hmm. uh, we talk a little bit about the theory of practice and uh, and the things you practice change you and change the way that you uh, exist within your uh, environment, mm. and that is why you cannot change a bourgeois politics by being in it. <laughs> yeah, you can't. And if you look at times in in history, you know, and I'm an Americanist, so I'm thinking of American history. Uh, if you look at situations where the political class ultimately did something that was more social democratic or more progressive, it was because of larger social movements that existed outside of it, right? If you think of the populist movement of the 1890s and how it sort of changed what would become the the emergence of that of the then Democratic Party, with the campaign of William Jennings Bryan, um, and the support of bimetallism, meaning that it was the support of having silver also back the dollar, not just gold, um, which was at that time a more populist move. Right, it was a more progressive right. move to do that. Or if you think of the New Deal and the emergence of the Socialist Party, the Ca- Communist Party, and political radicals who were involved in that, and then obviously the social movements of the 1960s. And how those were directly influenced by organizations 
that were developed by people who were of the anarchist tradition or the communist tradition, the Marxist tradition. So, um, yeah, I think that, 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 that's absolutely right. I mean, I feel like there, this is why I've always been of the mind and I think it's very important to build institutions, political, economic, social institutions, independent of the bourgeois state. Yeah which in the event of a revolution can then take over some of those duties of the state. Like that's like, you know, that sense of what they call dual power. I think that's, I think that's very relevant. Um, And something that the United States government is currently trying to, to um, criminalize in the form of the cop city protests. Yep. Um, uh, I think to kind of finish out, we'll talk about union and party. So we'll talk about how, you know, some Marxists and anarchists are more in favor of sort of organizing through parties. Some are more, and organizing through unions. Um, their general argument is, um, you know, uh, you know, radical syndicalism and a revolutionary political force both adapt to the new issues of the 21st century. This is what we must build in a complementary relationship. And I pretty much agree. I mean, I feel like it's, to me, it's not an, it's not an either or it's a yes. And so I feel like political parties, and I, I mean, for as much as I'm pro union and sort of those political quizzes I've taken, I tend to side more on the party end of it. But I think part of that's just because of my own political background as sort of being for while I am working class and in some respects I'm a proletariat and some other respects, I guess I am also like a petty bourgeois intellectual. So like I have to own that. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, so I think that that's really relevant. And I think that healthy balance between what, what we leave, what we have go through unions and that sort of syndicalism and then versus what we owe to the party. Mm. Um, and then the last real chapter is about anarchist ecology. They talk about Murray Bookchin cool. um, and the relevance of um, uh, the political economy. As they write, a declared opponent of capitalism, Bookchin observed that competitive nature, that the competitive nature of bourgeois society set not only each human being against the others, but also the whole of humanity against the natural world. Um, and I think as we've seen through some of the, probably the worst summer of my life, um, I think that in terms of weather and in terms of climate, I think that's very true. Um, like many libertaires, Bookchin insists on economic and political decentralization, direct democracy, the abolition of bureaucratic and political hierarchies, the management of social life by popular assemblies and local communities, what he sometimes calls libertarian municipalism. Now, they're rather critical of this. Um, so this is a very healthy debate, I think, within socialism, which is big versus local. Right. Uh, I'm going to put my cards at the table. I'm a big guy. I'm not just big in the sense that I'm you know six foot three and I weigh over 300 pounds. So I'm big that way. But I'm a big guy in the sense that I believe that really the challenges of our time are – we have big we have big problems that are going to be solved with big solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not like I'm not an anarcho primitivist. I'm not right. somebody who believes that like devolving things down to local structures will always make things better. Um, if anybody knows the history of American politics, sometimes when you devolve things to the local level, that's where you get sundown towns. Where right. Black people right. literally can't go there because they might get lynched. Um, I think that there's this kind of there's this kind of romantic notion that some things if it's local it's it's like better. And I don't buy that. I think it has to prove that it's better. It has to show right. that it's better. It can't just be seen as better because I think sometimes, as they write in the book, they sort of say like the autark the autarky of small units of life is not only regressive but impossible on a planet of several billion inhabitants. I think that's true. Um, and so I think it's relevant that. Um, yeah, I think I think there's a, a balance to be had somewhere in there, yeah. right? Because exactly. yeah, like you do need you do need like big discussions, but they have to still be made by the people, right? So yeah. you have to. That's why, like, you have to have a structure almost that can delegate people to speak. Yeah, in to tell other people what you've decided. <laughs> and that's the challenge of big kit, right? I mean, I think that's the challenge because, like, I know full and well that sort of my own politics and my view of of the world, which is that. I'm very much an enlightenment humanist. I believe that science and technology will allow for the flourishing of the human race. I right. genuinely do believe that. And and I know that, you know, for every polio vaccine, there's an atomic bomb. And I know that there's that that contradiction. But ultimately, I do believe that, it, you know, science and technology kind of got us into this mess. And I think it's kind of the only thing that's going to get us out. <laughs> right. um, I think uh, I, I kind of discussed this with Damien earlier today, too. Mm-hmm. Like. I am not a person who thinks that technology will 
Like, I don't think we can rely on some dude to like come up with a magic invention tomorrow to solve climate change. So <laughs> that's right. But we, so it still has to be a social solution. Yes. But and we this need is the technology yes. that we have currently to achieve these social solutions. I agree a hundred percent. And this is why it's so vital because if we don't make those clear distinctions and we don't build that sense of, of radical democracy, that revolutionary democracy, yeah. that, um, that it does devolve into technocracy. Right. And right. we sort of get the technocratic solutions that we have now, which clearly don't work. Um, and, and I think that that it leaves us to this sort of rule by experts, which I think is not healthy either. I right. think that people who are experts should be held accountable to the people. That they, they just shouldn't be able to do what they want simply by virtue of them being experts. They have to demonstrate that what they're going to do is actually going to be beneficial yeah. rather than just sort of doing it for doing sake. And I think a lot of that gets ends up getting fixed through um, democratic economic planning. As they write at the end of that ecological chapter, without democratic economic planning, there can be no eco, eco social revolution. Um, and Michael, uh, Michael Lowy wrote a book called Eco Socialism. Okay. So if you guys like this episode and you like what this guy had to say, we can do that book too. Cool. Um, I'm going to end with the last chapter, which is called Toward a Libertarian Marxism. And I'm going to leave you with, um, the quote that I think is, is really nice, and I think it's a great bow to our discussion tonight. They say, for us, libertarian Marxism is not a doctrine, not a finished body of theory. It is a matter, rather, of an affinity, of a certain political and intellectual approach, the shared desire to do away with, through revolutionary means, the dictatorship of capital in order to build an unalienated, egalitarian society, liberated from the authoritarian shackles of the state. And uh, then they say, we believe that the revolutionary culture of the future, that of 21st century emancipatory struggles, will be both Marxist and anarchist. And with that, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I do genuinely believe that we are in for the long haul, you know. Um, and I think that it took us some time to get into this mess. It's going to take us some time to get out. Um, but maybe we don't have time. Maybe we don't have time. Maybe we should do it now, right? With the climate crisis, the political, the ongoing political crisis, the rise of authoritarianism and fascism around the world, maybe we don't have time to sort of do this slowly. But I also think that it's relevant to note that if we go quickly, it may also fail. So, I mean, I think like it's, it's tough, which is part of the reason why yeah. as I get older and I learn more and I read more, my own view of socialism becomes less and less doctrinaire. And as they say in the book, it becomes more libertaire in the sense that I become more ecumenical. Yeah. I pull from a variety of different theories and ideas because I think that's how the world will actually work. I, I don't think that it's going to come sort of easily packaged in one clear point of view, nor should it because right. that's not democratic, right? Right. Yeah. So, you yeah, know, right. if we want to be a genuinely democratic society, it's got to be one that's pluralistic and tolerant of people who are different. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, that's how we're going to build the world that we want to live in. Um, and we want our children to live in or our children's children to live in. Right. A lot of us as socialists, I think we all kind of know that we're helping to build a world we may never live in. Yeah. That we'll more than likely not live in. Right. But that's, but that's irrelevant. We do it because it's, it matters anyway. Um, and so, you know, so that's why I think, we're in a new stage where I think we can get beyond these sort of artificial divisions and start learning from each other and from different um, theories and ideas. For sure. So that's revolutionary affinities. Um, Very cool. I think we've covered a tremendous amount of ground tonight. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and uh, before we finish up, um, if anybody has any questions, anything that you, you want us to kind of hit on more or elaborate on before we finish up, I'd be happy to, we'd be happy to. Uh, I'll go through the comments quick here. See if there's anything that. Okay. I missed that. We might, that might be a question of some sort. Um, okay. I guess not. I, I, uh, I, I guess to start off, we did get uh, two comments. Uh, it had to be said and some random geek both would like us to cover uh, Daniel Gu Gu Guerin uh <laughs> soon and what else uh the book name again oh 
Uh, it's called, uh, yeah, Sam, Sam Mulvey uh, asked what the book was called. It's called Revolutionary Affinities. Oh, of course. Yeah, Re- Revolutionary Affinities Toward a Marxist Anarchist Solidarity. It's by Michael Lowy or Lurie or Louis and Olivier besson um, translated by David Campbell. It is published by PM Press, um, and it just came out this year. Um, it's been out a few years, but it's not been out in English until now. Yeah. But yeah, Revolutionary Affinities, that's the book. Um, and uh, I think it's a wonderful read, and I think it pairs well with the other book that we discussed uh, earlier in the year called Libertarian Socialism, Politics, in Black and Red. Yeah. Um, I think good. these are really great companion books to read together. Um, we got uh, It Had to Be Said. I said uh, uh, with uh, Daniel Guerin, you could also George, uh, do George Woodcock and compare them. Yes, uh, George Woodcock we have on the schedule. So I got a copy of George, George Woodcock's book, Anarchism, at Left Bank Books in Seattle when I was there on vacation this year in April. Um, so yeah, we can definitely do that book. Um, that might be later in 2024, um, just because there are a few other books I'd like to hit before we hit that book. Um, that book, but, um, but yeah, no, that would be definitely one we could do for sure. And kind of compare and contrast, um, uh, that and, and Garen for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, I think, uh, I think that's basically it for questions and, and comments that we need to bring up. So, okay. I guess what's left, what are we covering next time? (laughs) So next time we will be doing, um, we will be doing the People's Republic of Walmart um, by Lee Phillips and Mikhail Rosorsky. I, I changed the schedule a little bit, uh, mainly just because I'm going to be out of town most of next week. Sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Kerrigan also said earlier, uh, Orthodox slash classical Leninists, as opposed to Marxist Leninists, emphasize pre-Civil War Lenin and post-Civil War Lenin's buyer's remorse in his last works. Yes. Very good point. Very, very good point. And I know, Kerrigan, that you had recommended a, a few books related to Leninism, um, especially Neil Harding's book, which I have behind me. Um, that book's huge. So it might be one that we do over like two episodes. <laughs> okay. Maybe like a part one, part two. There's actually a natural break because that, that book is actually two books put together. So uh, like it, we could do them as two episodes nice. just because it's a lot to cover, but I think you're right. Um, and that's a very, very good point. Um, I think that that's what makes Lenin a very interesting figure and one that I find a very fascinating to study, um, is because there's a lot of like weird, there's so much good and there's some, there's some, there's so much bad in some respects and there's a lot of contradictions and, um, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for him because he fucking tried, yeah. you know, and to a certain extent he ex- succeeded. Like, I, I mean, you know, like that. There's something to that. There's something to those who, who like get it done. Like I remember the first time I ever read the State Revolution, and it's basically a book that he didn't finish because. And so there's this little postscript at the end of the, the rush at the, of the end of his State Revolution where he's like, "Well, events of actually leading a revolution have led me to not be able to finish this book," and he finishes that book with like, "It's a lot more fun." It basically says like, "It's a lot more rewarding to do a revolution than write about one." <laughs> Which is a pretty badass statement. So, like, yeah, like I, I totally get it. And like, the Soviet Union is a fascinating topic for me. I've studied the Soviet Union since I was in college, and I think there's with with a lot of things. I think there's a tremendous amount of good about the history of the Soviet Union, a tremendous amount of bad, um, and everything in between. And I think yeah. it's to me, it's one of the core things to study as a socialist to learn what they did right, what they did wrong, and kind of avoid a lot of the pitfalls that they made. Um, and how to build a better socialist future. I think that we shouldn't shy away from that shit. When people say like, well, what about the Soviet Union? And just be very clear that like, well, there were some things the Soviet Union did right. And then kind of link, list those if you, you know, like whether it's you know, in the early years, especially like decriminalizing homosexuality and, and legalizing abortion. And mind you, they would end up criminalizing these things during the Stalin period, which a lot of MLs today won't fucking tell you. Um, they'll put out those like little documents, like see the Bolsheviks, they decriminalized abortion. It's like, well, they also, <laughs> yeah. they also like made it illegal again in the thirties under the 36 constitution right. was written under Stalin. Like, you know, like it's, you know, and then it wasn't, it was legal again. It wasn't legal again until the 1950s under Khrushchev. Like that's the kind of nuance that I want to see out of socialists, like to be honest. Yeah. You know, for sure. it's the difference between like analysis and propaganda to me. And propaganda has its place, but I just, I think that's really relevant. 
for sure. Um, okay, so we talked about what we're talking about next time. Mm-hmm. And so where can people find you? So you can find me at justinclark.org, right down there, a little link. <laughs> and um, I have a new article coming out in the Truth Seeker magazine this month, this September. Um, this September is the 150th anniversary issue of the Truth Seeker, um, which is a, which is a free thought publication based out of the United States. It's one of the o- oldest continuously publishing magazines in the United States. Um, and my article is about Robert Ingersoll and Abraham Lincoln. So it's sort of an analysis of sort of political history and memory as sort of seen through one of um, Lincoln's contemporaries, who was Robert Ingersoll. Um, and uh, you can also review all of my writing, which is available at justinclark.org, or um, my wor- writing that I do for work at the Indiana History Blog for the Indiana Historical Bureau that I do for my day job. So you can check me out there. And then also you can follow me on social media at Justin Clark PH, PH stands for public history. Um, and I am on Instagram and I'm on threads. So you can follow me there as well. Very cool. Well, I got to say this has been a really nice stream. Uh, thank you for everybody who, for the comments and the questions. And like, this is, this is exactly what I've been hoping to do. This is the kind of community I wanted to build. Let's keep this going. That's, awesome. That's great. And I know this one was a little on the long end, but I figured it was a lot of really interesting content that people would get something out of. So I wanted to kind of get into the weeds a little bit. Yeah, That's awesome. Right on. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And thank you so much for all your comments. Thank you. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie Athope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, Or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.